إنك لا تهدي من أحببت ولكن الله يهدي من يشاء. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Welcome to the Young Smiths podcast. I have a very special guest, Sheikh Abdul Rahman Hassan. How are you doing? How you doing? Sheikh, it's good to see you. It's been a long time. So I remember when you came to my house. Manchester, mashallah. Inshallah, I wanted, to, I wanted you to do some research for me, inshallah. Inshallah. Do you remember about, uh, do you remember what we were speaking about? Yeah, you asked me about Torah. Oh, the, the, the Bible and the the Bible stuff and like Torah, that, yeah. Yeah. Inshallah, yeah. I'm going to push you for that later, inshallah. So, Shaykh, subhanAllah, you know, I just want to thank you for your time, you know, agreeing to do a podcast. Uh, benefited a lot from you over the years. Jazakallah khair. And, um, Basically, I just want to introduce people to yourself, you know, from my audience, uh, people who are watching, uh, introduce them to the people like yourself. So, I've seen your podcast with uh, the hot seat. He's, he's sat in the background there, just give him a shout out. And you're speaking about your uh, journey, you know, your, uh, you know, where you were brought up, how you were studying, seeking knowledge, etc. I just wanted to touch upon that a little bit, not too much, because I want to direct people towards the actual podcast itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But just as a brief introduction uh, for yourself, just for people who don't know you, um, could you just tell us a bit about yourself? Inshallah ta'ala. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursaleen, Sayyidina wa Nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa ashabi wa tabi'ina lahum bi ihsanin ila yawmi deen amma ba'd. First of all, jazakallah khairan for having me. I'm honored. And this is more of an opportunity for me, to be honest, to yeah. convey the message of Islam, to call to the deen of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So it's, yeah. it's an honor, Jazakallah khairan, for having me. Uh, may Allah honor you and add it to your uh, yeah. scale of righteous deeds, the day of judgment. Um, I'm your simple brother, Abdurrahman, who grew up in the UK, um, went to uh, school in North London, um, studied yeah. nursery, reception, and primary school. In, and first, first year, or first two years in London. So I, it was either the ending of year seven, um, or it was the first couple of months of year eight. Um, and then I moved to uh, Birmingham. Uh, I stayed there for a very p short period of time. One thing I'm very bad at is I don't keep track of time in the sense mm. where I don't remember how long I spent in particular places. Mm. Um, that's something I'm very bad at. So I started, uh, the older I got, to, mm. to start writing down things and start jotting things down. And uh, if I knew that this was going to be about me, this whole podcast, I would have probably scribbled some things uh, down. Um, so I grew up in the UK environment. Um, my father, who was a student in Saudi Arabia who had studied with Sheikh Ibn Baz, who had met Sheikh Al-Albani um, really focused uh, in our upbringing on the religion. He focused mm. greatly on it. He used to give a lot of importance to it. And my uncle is Ahmad Tahir Awais, who is a PhD graduate uh, from Jamia Islamia Medina. He graduated in 1996 uh, in, in his PhD. 1996, so he had graduated in his BAs or his Masters way before that. So he used to live with us for a period of time. Shaykh Ahmed Tahir lived with us in our house. And he got us one of his greatest, greatest students in Qur'an. Mm -hmm. So he, he, he told him if he can teach us the Qur'an. So I finished the Qur'an when I was very young. Sure. Uh, he'd made, he, did, he, you know, he, he made us memorize uh, small books of hadith. Uh, but at that time, it was all just memorizing. We didn't know what we were doing. We didn't understand it. A turning point for my father was my younger brother went to school one day and when he went to school, just to show you how the UK changed, subhanAllah, my young brother went to school and um, in school, in primary school, they were teaching us about the intruders, uh, Henry VIII, mm. and him be beheading his wives. And subhanAllah, in that class, he, the teacher mentioned something related to Christianity the you know different types of Christians mm. and my brother came home and he exaggerated and he said dad they're, they're trying to make me a Nasrani they want me to become a Christian <laughs> you know 
uh, and me and my older brother, we took it the year before. So he exaggerated on that point <clears throat> and he said, I don't want to go to that class. I mean, I don't want to learn about this. I want to, I want to learn Tawheed and uh, Aqidah and this is, this is it's wrong. It's wrong. How old it. is he at this time? So he's, um, he's about eight. SubhanAllah. Eight, seven, eight. Yeah. So um, he, my dad went to school and said, look, my son is, a, you know, is having a problem with this class. Can, is there something that we can do to, to avoid it? They said, this is a main, this is, every class, every subject has to be taken. And subhanAllah, how things have changed, wallahi, how things have changed. They actually reached a point where they took that class off my, off my younger brother. They said, you don't have to study it. It's, you know, the guy, the head of the education in, in the borough, in, in Haringey, came down to our house mm -hmm. and sat with us and asked us questions and said, look, we are tolerant of different religions. Mm -hmm. If your son doesn't feel comfortable, we will not force him. And uh, don't worry. And so for my father, he got worried after that. He thought you know, something might be, might be done to his son. Um, so that's why we moved to Birmingham. Mm. I didn't move straight away. I stayed a, a bit before that. And then from there, when I went to Birmingham, I, I found it hard to stay in uh, school, to be honest. Not because of bad behavior, to be honest. It wasn't that bad um, but I wouldn't say I was good as well mm. but um, my uh, my love for learning science maths English wasn't 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 high but I had passion for learning the Quran because I had at that time not now but I had good recitation mm. of, my voice was nice and so I used to go to hafalat these weddings they would call me I'd, I'd, I'd open it for them I mean I yeah. I'll do it so I was got love from that so i was like oh wow this is maybe what i should do and so this is when i thought to myself maybe i want to leave so at the age of 12 maybe mm. 13 maybe even 14 around that time i um I'm, I'm, i brought it to my father you know maybe i want to leave and travel so i embarked on the first journey of going to uh, my home country somalia mm. for the first time and i went there and it was a life-changing experience for me, to be honest. I spent the next three to four years uh, over there. Again, I don't know the language very well. Mm. I don't know the culture too well. And all of these people, even though they're cousins, relatives, uh, they are foreigners to me. I don't know who they are. Um, and people back there... Where Did you, you have the language? Yeah. It was there, but it was very weak. Yeah. And Somalis are people who love to make yeah. fun of people. That's, their, that's the way they are. Mm. They'll make fun of how you walk. There's rarely a Somali person you would meet except he's got a nickname, a very terrible nickname. <laughs> so, uh, What's yours, Shah? Um, they used to call me, uh, I hope it doesn't go viral if people don't call me it now. <laughs> no, um, leave it, leave it. No, I can say no, 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 no. Okay, no, 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 no. okay. <laughs> so, so uh, what happened was they, they picked on that, yeah. on, that, on that name and so they... I, had, I have to say the nickname, it's just so people don't think it's the worst of worst. <laughs> it was the... Um, I had hardship in walking when I went there in, yeah. the, in the sand. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't used to walking in the sand. So I would avoid the sand going into my shoes and sort of slightly jump when I walk. And I do sl still have a weird way of walking. So they used to call me uh, what would loosely translate in English as bouncer, someone who bounces. Yeah. So they gave me that name in school. I, I found it very disrespectful, but who cares? It's, they don't care. <laughs> and they love it when you fight with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I called my father many occasions, telling him, look, dad, this is what they're doing to me. Basically, they're bullying me. <laughs> Get on with it. It's not going to change. So what happened was there was a brother at that time who mm. came one in mm. the whole country. He came number one in school. And if you came number one, there was like a, uh, the whole country, there's an exam that the, person, the, student ha the student has to do. And if he comes first, he gets sent to a scholarship he gets from Yemen. And he gets good money, gets taken sure. care of. Sure the Yemeni government will give him, or Sudan, or other countries like that. So he came number one, and again, Somali tribalism. Mm -hmm. Someone put another person's paper first, and he's one got pushed back, and he had never ended up going. So but he was a person who was very yeah. grounded yeah. in nearly everything uh, he was grounded. So the school, in order to uh, uh, you know, make him feel good and apologize for what happened, they gave him a... 
a number of students that were sent from foreign countries. Mm. So there was like a year, there was a class that was made for myself mm. and other, other students who came from uh, Sweden, Canada and different mm. countries. SubhanAllah, he's a powerful story here that I, I never ever, I never remember to mention in my biography, which is I came into that class and the teacher sat down in the first class he taught us was grammar, Arabic grammar. I'm about 13, so he's now going to start Nahu. So he wrote on the board, you know, the first part of Al Kalam speech in the Arabic language is divided into this and that, and this is what it means. And in the class, there are students from Canada. Uh, there was students from um, Sweden and subhanallah we kept in that class we studied I studied all of Ejrumiya with him that was a book mm. that he was teaching us it's a basic Arabic oh, grammar yeah. textbook a beginner book for, for, for someone who wants to learn grammar and in my class there was a girl who came from Canada she didn't really like this whole idea of studying the religion and learning Arabic or anything it's sad to say this but I'm not going to mention names or anything but Recently, when I spoke to her, she left the religion of Islam, subhanAllah. Uh, she said, I, I don't believe in Allah, Azza wa Jalla. She got influenced by uh, some of these figureheads in the UK who fight against Islam. And to be honest, it really hit me that, subhanAllah, how <coughs> using social media in a very uh, negative way against mm. Islam, or even saying things, how it can influence someone. And the opposite is true, that using your social media, using mm. your YouTube channel, to propagate al-Islam, how it can affect mm -hmm. other people as well. So subhanAllah, the shubha, even when I tried to discuss it with her, the shubha was too deep for me to be able to convince. It will take a, a long time for me to convince the, that this is it's not true. And um, I studied there Arabic. And the idea was that for me to go into the secondary school over there, the secondary school over there is in Arabic. The teachers, they speak Arabic. So I had to learn Arabic for that one year. Mm. So it's equivalent to uh, a year of University of Medina Ma'had that you mm. have to do before you go into the Jama'at, something like that. Yeah. But here we were doing more classical books, which is another thing Somali is very, I found it very unique and they don't teach you a curriculum set by this or that country. Mm. They just teach you classical books. Mm. Um, so that was my first, first moving from the UK and adapting in another environment. Now that this, this the, the emotional part of it was that my mother, my father was there when I first landed, but he only stayed there for a couple of months. He had to go back mm -hmm. to the UK. So I spent the next three years, to be honest, my dad was, he never came back. And my mum wasn't there. I think she visited me only once. Uh, I was taken real good care of, but I had to seek knowledge with basically my own, mm. my own ambition and my own hard work. So I revised the Qur'an very well over there. There was a teacher, may Allah honor him, Ma'ala Abdul Wahab. Uh, Ma'ala means teacher. Uh, Abdul Wahab was a very strong Qur'an teacher. So he taught me the Qur'an and he also made sure I memorized Thalathat uh, al-Usul. Mm. We used to do a portion of that and we also used to do three fundamentals mm. um, and the Qur'an, we used to revise um, then I heard about a class that was announced in our local area that mm. was teaching the tafsir. SubhanAllah, it was amazing because I didn't even want to go there, to be honest. I was happy with my, my, my schedule and I had a private teacher coming home, teaching me. I liked that. But then what happened was I came to just one of the classes because my uncle, called, my, my mum's brother, my uncle, my maternal uncle told me to come. And so I came and I sat in the class. And it was so large. I'm not exaggerating if I say at least a thousand people attended. Mm. The roads were closed. And so then th to me, it's like, why would people do this? Mm. Just to hear tafsir, it's all online. SubhanAllah. And SubhanAllah, some people come, the class used to start um, after Isha. And some people would come at Asr in order to get into the masjid, not the front line. In order to just get into the masjid. And so this really amazed me, truly amazed me. And I was shocked by the numbers. Um, not that it really matters. A mm. uh, number doesn't really matter. Mm. But it did catch my attention. Mm. Mm. So I got into the masjid. And uh, I made it, first of all, I made it my mission in order to get into the masjid, in order to listen to the class. And that took me a, a while. I was came late. 
didn't end up coming on time. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, I came in and I did the whole entire tasir of the Quran uh, with the Shaykh and my jaw dropped, especially when we came to Asbab al of Ayat mm. and the meaning of each verse, what it means and what is in there and the context of it, a verse that you've been reading all your life. This is where it came down on. I remember subhanAllah hearing that. It was the one class that caught my attention. And I've always felt like that when it comes to tafsir. If tafsir mm. is taught by an expert, someone who knows mm. the Quran, who knows the tafsir of the Quran and can also articulate it well, mm. it's the general mass, this is what they need. It has to be. How long, did, how long was this program? So the Sheikh had the tafsir for a year. Uh, the tafsir was ongoing, it was twice a week, taqriban. Um, but there were also other books that he was teaching. Hmm. Kitab al-Tawheed, al-Wasatiyah, uh, fiqh books, nahw, grammar. We would, hmm. From that class I came to in his tafsir, from there onwards I said I want to be with the Sheikh. I really hmm. want to be with him. Would you say that everyone was like a student of knowledge or would you say there was also like the average Muslim just actually enjoying and learning and taking benefit? Yeah, there were, there were, there were, there were a mixture of all hmm. of that. There were general masters that were sitting there, hmm. that were not taking notes but they were just listening. Um, subhanallah, what amazed me was that the women were not literally number. There were th there were hundreds of women coming that would sit in the halaqa and they would they would put their questions, they would write their questions to the sheikh, and it was really uh, really solid when it came to uh, the hudur and the presence of people loving the religion. And now what you can what you can understand is the dynamics of Somalia change now. Mm. Things are much better now, uh, safety and security wise. Even that though you hear. Um, bad things happen here or there but at that time there was no government it was sure. chaos there was no government there was no law and order so everybody does whatever they want whoever's strong overpowers who's weak mm -hmm. but uh, these people subhanallah with all of that being said the worst of the worst um, Quran was still there. I'll tell you a story that shocked me, really shocked me. There was highway, ro highway robbers, Somali had highway robbers where ch every checkpoint you come, you get stopped, money's taken from you. If you don't pay money, you get shot. It's n there's no wasting time. No, nah, I mean, it's not. And uh, there was a man who, so, the, so it's, it's owned by tribes. Each tribe has their own highway, you know, checkpoint. They take money from people and that's where they live on. So what happened was, um, um, we, we were in a car, the driver was told to pay this much. He goes, but yesterday I paid that much. They said, well, it was being risen. Oh, what can you do? And he started to complain a bit, say, look, it's not fair. I didn't expect that. Look, I wasn't aware of it. Um, you guys just change your money as you wish. And of course, the highway robbers, they are going to do that. So then they said, you know what, if you, do you have a problem? He said, yeah, I do have a problem. He said, go to the man over there. It was, it was a guy lying on the ground, you know, and something over his head. It was, it was kind of sleeping. So he went. And it was someone that was shot. They shot the person and, you know, flies were over his head and everything. What, that's not what shocked me because that's normal in the country. But what shocked me was the guy who's running the whole operation is sitting there with four of his friends and they're doing surah of the Qur'an. Surah means ayah, ayah, ayah. They're literally reciting the Qur'an. This is the guy who's the head of the, the checkpoint. He and his four of his friends are sitting there and they're taking verse by verse. Each one takes a verse. And they read it. Yeah. So it's people like that who, when it comes to the Quran, they just memorize it. But then what they're disconnected from is that tafsir that I go to. Then they don't have, they, they, they're not reciting the mm. Quran with understanding and comprehension here. So I carried on those classes with the Sheikh and uh, I truly, really benefited. Um, and also, I learned another thing which is, and I think it's very important, subhanAllah, which is. Um, number one, I found out when I came back to the UK. People in the UK have this uh, method, like lifestyle where criticism and, 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 and pointing out someone's fault is seen as a very like disrespectful, rude mm. uh, thing. Like, like why, are you, why are you mentioning that person's mm. fault? Whereas when I, where I came from in Somalia, it was, it was the way forward. It was like everyone who's around you would tell you what's wrong. Like mm. that's how you, you progressed. Mm. It was normal, they, like nobody took it, mm. no one took it to heart. Yeah. Like the criticism that was put at you, uh, mm. the faults of yours that was mentioned. Because the asal, as I said to you, the, the mm. default position mm. for Somalis is that 
they look at you to scan a mistake. Yeah. And so you learn to uh, be strong enough to know like, it doesn't, doesn't bother me, really, it doesn't bother me. That's one thing I felt like was good for me because it helped yeah. me because I wasn't living with my mum and I had to integrate with society and, and work with people. And if everything everyone said was, yeah. was, was, was a sense, well, I was sensitive about it, I don't think I'd go forward. Mm -hmm. Another thing I learned was to be independent. Like I left my mum at the age of 13 or 14. Mm -hmm. Whereas when I came back, some of my siblings were still, no, mom, mom, mom. Mm. I, wasn't, yeah. I wasn't in need of that. I could, sure. I could travel, I could do what I had to do. I could set myself a schedule. So it's, mm. sometimes people don't understand that when you go and seek knowledge, it's not just ulum shar'iyya, Islamic knowledge that you come back with. You also learn how to carry yourself and, and you really learn about yourself. That's another thing. Mm. One of my shuyukh used to say that people are scared of the, uh, they're scared of being alone with themselves. Mm. So what they always do is they surround themselves with other people. They cloud their, their, their thought process with uh, their, their phones and their gadgets. Because mm. they know if they have to sit in a place for five minutes and think about themselves and where they are and where they're heading and what they've done in the past, it's very scary for them. And they, they, they're scared of that. Mm. So every time they're listening to something, they uh, they are it's like busy in themselves. Busy in themselves. Thing. They just can't be alone. And he said, if you are able to sit down and, and enjoy those moments of thinking over yourself and what you've done, mm -hmm. and where you where you're going wrong, and where you wanted to be going, your direction, he said, you'll be successful in life. So I had a very good dream at the beginning of my life. I had a very uh, which weakened as I got older. And my ambition died out. But I really wanted to go deep into understanding the religion and having a gr you know, strong... Um, I really found every person who taught me, I thought to myself, you know, they were born nine months just like I was. Mm. Is there anything that they're given <coughs> that I'm not given? I mean, Allah says in the Quran, وَاللَّهُ أَخْرَجَكُمْ مِن بُطُونِ أُمَّهَاتِكُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ شَيْئًا I brought you out, the, out of the womb of your mothers, mm. not knowing anything. So no one knew nothing. All the great scholars that we look up to, Ibn Taymiyyah, Al Imam al Bukhari, Al Imam Muslim, all the great scholars that we look up to, I mean, they weren't scholars when they came out of the womb of their mm. mothers. So for me, it was like, why can't I pass my own teachers? Mm. Why can I not mm. be more greater than them? Shaykh, this is a, a very important point. Um, you know, a lot of the time you see people, maybe they go and study for five, six years, and one thing that is known about you, amongst the people is you're, you're constantly studying. Mm. Do, you, do you know what I mean? You're like you, you are someone who's constantly studying the religion. Mm. It, you didn't just study the religion for, mm. you know, five or six years mm. in a university and that's mm. it. You know, you're running on the knowledge that you, that you learnt. From what's known about you is being a scholar is not just about graduating from a university. It's a constant so, study. Mm. And, uh, you know, when, I, when, I, when we learn about your sort of very intensive studying, reading for so much of the day, studying for so much of the day, it's not, it, you, you don't get to the end of studying. Mm -hmm. do, you, mm -hmm. do, so do you know what I'm saying? I mean, well, it's, yeah. it's a reality that the more you learn, the more you realise you didn't know. Mm. And there are many instances, many, many instances in my life that I come across that I regret I spoke about particular things which I haven't yet, I didn't yet understand it properly. Mm. And now I know I'm gonna look at it another 10 to 15 years and say to myself that you didn't still understand it. Mm. The more you really study, hakikatan, the more you learn, the more you realize that you don't know or you didn't know. And the scholars like Al Imam Dhabi, he said, that knowledge is an ocean that doesn't have a shore. Mm. It doesn't have a shore, so it doesn't, there's no ending point. And there's always more to learn and there's more to gain. Um, the poet, he said, like Just go and seek knowledge. And don't give up in seeking knowledge. Don't think to yourself, it's enough. 
you know, I can't do anymore. This is, this is more than enough. Don't. فَعَفَةُ الطَّالِبِ أَنْ يَطْجَرَى One of the greatest calamities and, uh, for a student of knowledge is that he stops seeking knowledge and he gives up. Then the poet said, أَمَا تَرَى الْمَاءَ بِتَكْرَارِهِ Do you not see that the water, its consistent repetition on a rock, قَدْ أَثَّرَى It's affecting it. So there are issues in the religion that are very complicated for me at times, to be honest, and I don't have understanding of it. And I have to read it a lot of times until I, until I can digest it. Uh, or I have to listen to, or get, I, have to let, I have to participate and go to a lecture or a lesson in order for the Sheikh to really break it down for me, for me to understand. So, I mean, from, from my perspective, like your, your classes are more, I would say, at least at intermediate level. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't think we've seen anyone teach Islam in English at, at that level before. And some people would arguably say that it shouldn't be te taught mm. at that level in, in the English language. What, yeah. would you, what would you say about that? Yeah, it's true. It's a criticism that, that, has, mm. that has got a valid, valid, valid mm. observation, to be honest, yeah. that the English language... Um, however much you know it and however mm. good you are in the English language, conveying it in the uh, English language is always not going to be, yeah. it's not going to be 100%. That being said though, um, it, we shouldn't think that it's mm. not going to uh, convey the, 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 the point or yeah. convey the message. Um, for example, I studied the tafsir of the Qur'an uh, in my language, my 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 my, my Somali. Somali language, yeah, and uh, and many of the books that I start, I now know, I studied them in my language. Sure. So it wasn't in the Arabic language that mm. I studied it in. Um, I have with other shuyukhs, but I also studied it in mm. Somali language. So the religion can be conveyed mm. in other languages, mm. but without a doubt, if we say that, would it be better for a student mm. to study in the English language, or is it better for them to study mm. in the uh, uh, in the uh, Arabic language, I would say in the Arabic language. Mm. But even me, my classes, to be honest, a lot of the times I've recently tried to make it into real English and break yeah. down each point. But even if you listen to them, you tend to find that I, I, I speak a lot of Arabic. Yeah, you use all the terminology. And I leave the I leave yeah. the definitions in in Arabic. I mention them. The hadiths I mention mm. them in Arabic. The principles I mention them in Arabic. Mm. And then if I choose to translate, mm. I do, and a lot of times I forget to translate. Mm. So even the person who wants to listen to my classes has to have mm. a certain level of the Arabic yeah. language. Yeah. It wouldn't be easy for mm. a person who's uh, a beginner, yeah. student of knowledge, or a person who doesn't know the Arabic mm. language. Sheikh, what would you, what is the basic level of knowledge that every Muslim should have? Like, you know, in, I'm talking to the English Muslims, really. From the, from the English Muslims, like what is the level they should be? It's actually amazing because I, I, I just now started a, a project where I wanted to write a book for the knowledge that every single Muslim must know in all of the fields of the religion. Mm. And when I say, sure. the, like fit, for example, what do I really need to know? Mm. Um, as a new Muslim who just entered Islam, what do I have to do now? What's the, mm. the, yeah. the, 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 the thing I have to do? And the scholars, they call that ilm hal Mm. al hal means the knowledge of this moment, this mm. minute. And uh, so you're writing a book about. I'm writing. On, I'm, yeah, I'm working on that. And in also, in what does a person have to know from uh, the aqidah? Mm. Like, do I have to know the intrinsic details of issues of mm. aqidah? I mean, a lot of people they confuse a new Muslim with the views of the firaq. Mm. So the Jahmiya believe this. Mm. The Mu'tazila believe this. Yeah. Like, he doesn't need to know that. He doesn't need mm. to know what is for him. Mm. Even even as a new Muslim, they can have problems articulating their belief. Yeah. I remember uh, Sheikh Abu Osama was telling me when he he first went to Medina University, one of the students said, "Where's Allah?" Yeah. He said, "Everywhere." Yeah. And he beat him up. <laughs> Subhanallah. So Sheikh, Sheikh beat him up. Subhanallah. And they nearly kicked him out of the university. Allah. But he's a new Muslim. You know, he does. He's not studied. You he's know, at studied. that point. So you know, and and um, it, it's really important that you know as a as a, not, not just a new Muslim, newly practicing Muslims, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, what do we need to know? Because what I'm finding, Sheikh, in this day and age now, you see, you've got people who have little knowledge 
about Islam, but they are they they are educated. They they've got a degree, they've got uh, a master's maybe or a PhD. They they have they they are intelligent people, but they just they've not studied Islam. Mm. So you find that a lot of people are reading about topics which are this okay. level of Islam when That's they've it. not got the basics. That's true. So one of the big issues that I I, I find today is. Uh, the Ashley Athari understanding of Islam, mm -hmm. you know, the difference between the two and, and why one is correct over the other. Mm -hmm. And it, because I know, I know this is not like the, what someone should be speaking about on a basic level, Sorry. but this is like one of the main things, Sheikh. Yeah, going on, and uh, if you could possibly give us some advice on that. And also uh, in terms of, where, you know, in terms of uh, who the Muslims are generally. You understand? Because a lot of the times people are extreme in, in takfir and things like sahih, this as well. Sahih, sahih. You see, when it comes to the issue of uh, hastening something before it's time, mm. there's a principle in the, in the religion which is uh, mm. If someone hastens something before it's timing, the reality is that you get prevented from it. Mm. For example, the scholars, they give an example of a, a son whose father is very wealthy. His father's very rich, mm. and um, the inheritance that he's going to take from his father is large. Mm. The portion that he's going to be given is going to be very large. So what he does is that at night he takes a pillow and suffocates his father, and his father dies. He kills his father in order to inherit him. Now, this was going to come in the sense where mm. your father probably might have died before you, and you would have inherited him. What you've now done is you hasten the process. Mm. You're, now not, you're, going, you're going to be prevented from this. You're not going to inherit your father. Mm. And this is the same, they say, when it comes to knowledge or even positions. Yeah. Um, hastening your, before your time and trying to put yourself in a position when you haven't reached it yet. Um, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she said, Umirna an nunzil an nasa manazilahum. We were commanded. She's saying that the Prophet commanded us to place the people in their positions. Mm. So everybody should be put in their place. Like the student should know that he's just a student of knowledge and he's, that he's, and he's not a mufti in the sense where he mm. can give fatwa unrestrictedly mm. and he's not a mujtaid like that. Mm. He can speak about what he knows and what he understands. Mm. And this is again from the things that the Prophet told us, alayhi salatu wasalam, is from the signs of the hour, that this is going to happen. Mm. And it's mean, qada illahi al qadari. It's qadari, kawni, universal, it's going to happen and it's, it's going to take place. And it's the famous hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As in the Sahihain. Inna Allah la yantazi'u al-ilma intiza'a yantazi'u min suduri al-rijal walakin yantazi'u al-ilma biqabdi al-ulama hatta idha lam yubqa, hatta idha lam yubqa aliman itakhada al-nas ru'usan juhala fasu'ilu fa'aftaw bighayri ilmin fadallu wa adallu That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith that Allah will not just take knowledge like that. Mm. But he'll take knowledge by taking its people. And so there's no scholar left. Scholars are going to die. Mm. You're going to hear Sheikh so-and-so, yeah, he's dead. Sheikh so-and-so, he died. Sheikh so-and-so, he died. So the ulama are going to pass away. And there's no one to really take their position. The people are now going to take the ignorant ones as their references. Mm. And the ignorant one, of course, is ignorant. He thinks he knows. He's going to tell the people, you know, um, what, was, what was the question again? And he answers the people. What was the question again? And he answers. فَظَلُّوا وَظَلُّوا He misguides himself and he misguides others. Mm. And Imam Shatibi, the other day I was reading it, subhanAllah. He mentions from the reason, it goes back to the question you were asking, uniting the Muslims and, and Muslims. Mm. He mentions that, and Imam Shatibi mentions that, مِنْ أَسْبَابِ الْفُرْقَةِ وَالْإِخْتِلَافِ One of the reasons that brings about disunity and, and, mm. and, and breaks the Muslim ranks and causes confusion amongst the general mass is تَرْئِيسُ الْجَهَلَةِ Mm. Pushing forward the ignorant people. Mm. Like when you know, ignorant people are pushed forward, mm. what they do is they speak about issues. Well, like Shatibi said something very powerful here. He said that when ignorant people give fatwa, the ones mm. who don't know, when they give verdicts and they give fatwa, mm. um, the general mass doesn't know that this person is an ignorant person. He mm. thinks, okay, he's got a microphone, he's wearing an imama, mm. he used the word ya'ani a couple of times. He also threw in Tayyip, mm. so he must be a scholar. Mm. 
Yeah. And so what they do is they consider his khilaf a khilaf, mm. meaning his differences mm. equal to the scholars. Mm. So they say the scholars differed in this issue. Mm. Like Shatibi said, we don't consider these people to be scholars. Mm. It's not a valid difference. Yeah, yeah. like it's, it's mm. of no weight. Um, so this is what happens. People push them forward. They say, this is my sheikh, my sheikh said. And this is very, very common nowadays. Um, the poet, he said, Rahimahullah, Imam Abdullah al-Shanqiti, Rahimahullah, he said, وَالْكُلُّ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَنَاحِ الْأَرْبَعَةِ يَقُولُ لَا أَدْرِ فَكُنْ مُتَّبِعَةً All of the great scholars, Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, Al-Shafi, Al-Ahmed, there were times, many occasions, where they were asked questions and they said, Allah, Allah knows. Mm -hmm. no, we don't know. He was asked, and Imam Malik was asked, as Ibn Abdul Barr mentioned, 40 something times, he was asked a question. And every time he would say, Allah, 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 I don't know, I don't know. Subki wrote a book on, La Adri only. I don't know. Mm -hmm. All the times that the scholars and the Sahaba said, La Adri. A man came to Abdullah ibn Umar and he said to him, I have a question. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu said to him, uh, ask. And he asked. And he said, La Adri. I don't know. Allahu alam. And then he said, You are the son of Umar radiallahu anhu. You are Abdullah ibn Umar. Mm -hmm. And you don't know? This is what they do to you people. When you can't mm -hmm. answer the question, they mm -hmm. say, Oh, but you've been studying for so long. How can you not know? Mm -hmm. At that moment, you should still hold your grounds, as Abdullah ibn Umar did. What did he say? He said, la adiri. The answer hasn't changed. Mm. So the general mass upon them is that they go back to the scholars and they ask them. The poet, he said, وَلَيْسَ فِي فَتْوَاهُ مُفْتِ الْمُتَّبَعَ مَا لَمْ يُضِفْ لِلْدِينِ لِلْعِلْمِ وَالْوَرَى The person who's a general mass, mm. his job isn't, because he wouldn't know who's a, he wouldn't know the difference mm. between the scholars and everything. Whoever he believes in, is in terms of knowledge and piety and righteousness, he goes to that person and he asks and he leaves. Mm. Now he's a blind follower because he doesn't know. He shouldn't go about and force people on his view that he's mm. blind following on other people, mm. especially those who can read and study. And we're finding that. Mm. A group of people love to blind follow a particular sheikh yeah. or a particular uh, madhab. You're entitled to. If you want to blind follow mm. the sheikh, you can be, as the scholars, they say, um, you can be like a dead body in front of the one mm. who's washing it. You can choose to be like that. Mm. But not everybody's dead. Mm. In other words, not everybody wants to blind follow. Yeah. Some people are able to read, strengthen mm. between the statements of the scholars. Mm. Coming to the second part of your question, which is nowadays dividing Ash'ariya and Athariya and all of this. The scholars used to consider, like Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and other great scholars, that the term Al-Athari and the Salafi, and the Sunnah, mm. and the Firqa al Najiya, al Ta'ifa al Mansura, um, all to be synonyms. Mm. There's no difference between them. Which we're seeing a trend now where Atharia is seen to be different to Salafia. Yeah. And the poet he said, وَكَمْ مِنْ عَائِبٍ قَوْلًا صَحِيحًا وَآفَتْهُ مِنَ الْفَهْمِ السَّقِيمِ How many people criticize those who say that they are the same? But the problem isn't with those who are saying it's the same. It's with the problem, yeah. the one who's trying to make it different. They're both exactly the same. Mm. Al-Athari and the salafi both mean mm. the same. What is Al-Athari? There are different opinions regarding the scholars, what they say. Some scholars, they say Al-Athar is what comes from the uh, Tabi'een. Mm. And some scholars, they say, no, it's what comes from the Tabi'een and the Sahabas. And there are very small scholars who say that athar is also what the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because mm. what the Prophet said is either a khabar or a hadith mm. like in what comes from the Sahabas or the Tabi'een is considered to be an athar yeah. and the reason why they refer to that as athar is because this is mafraq al turuq where they divide, the innovators divide and mm. go separate from mm. Ahlul Sunnah which is when you bring a verse forward, an ayah forward mm. or you bring a hadith forward the question is, how did you understand this? Mm. Like Islam doesn't need reforming. Yeah. How did you understand this ayah? Mm. How did you understand this hadith? Allah says in the Quran, uh, mm. Allah mentioned in that verse, taking a path other than the path of the believers. The Prophet said in the hadith, Imran Hussein, in Sahih, the Prophet said, خير الناس قرني ثم الذين يلونهم 
Thumma al-ladhina yaluna. The best of generation is mine, mm. in the one I'm living in. And then those who came, come after and those who come after. Mm. Allah said in the Quran, وَالسَّابِقُونَ الْأَوَّلُونَ مِنَ الْمُهَجِرِينَ وَالْأَنصَارِ وَالَّذِينَ تَبَعُهُمْ بِإِحْسَانٍ Allah mentioned three groups of people. Allah mentions the muhajirin, He mentions the ansar and those who follow them. Mm. So we're not muhajir or ansar. We, mm. we were, we're only going to be mm. the third, inshallah ta'ala. Inshallah. So this is why the term athari refers back to the sahabas mm. and the tabi'in and where, what their understanding of these mm. verses are. As for ash'ariyah, goes back to a imam whose name is Abil Hassan al-Ash'ari. Abil Hassan al-Ash'ari <coughs> His mother, Abul Hassan Ashad, in his first phase, I mean, his first portion of his life, he was a Mu'tazili. Mm. Mu'tazili. He was of the belief of the Mu'tazila, mm. the belief of Amr ibn Ubaid and Wasim ibn Atta, mm. the Mu'tazila. Mm. Abul Hassan Ashari, they say the first 40 years he was uh, Mu'tazili. Because of his uh, mother, was married to a man by the name of uh, Abu Ali uh, al Jubbai. Abu Ali al-Jubba'i was a Mu'tazili mm. and was married to his mother. So, of course, this mm. is what the madhab of Abu Hassan was. And he and his uh, uncle had a conflict mm. in discussion and they couldn't come to agreement on it. And he left the madhab. And when he left the madhab, he became uh, ala tariqatul kullabiya. Mm. So, the sha'ira today and the kullabiya are the same, mm. which is that okay. um, they affirm seven characteristics as they say um, which they call it sifat al-sabah sabah and the third phase that Abil Hassan al-Ash'ari went into is when he repented mm. he repented from all of that he even left the belief of the kullabiyah and he wrote a couple of books to express his repentance from them is his kitab al-ibana fi usuri diyana al-risala tu ila ahli thagar ikhtilaf al-musallin he wrote these books to prove his repentance. Mm. So imagine following a madhab, that the mm. man who, who established that madhab, he himself has repented from it. He left it, he walked away from it. Mm. And he's no longer of that, of that madhab that you attribute yourself to. Mm. So when you really ponder, uh, those who are now saying that I'm, I'm on the Athari creed, I'm on the Athari way, if you look at them and you ponder, and you think they are people generally who are Mm. or either from the Asha'ira background mm. or have Asha'ari tendency mm. or they are people who dumb down Aqeedah and its essence and its importance in the first place it doesn't mm. have no value to them so you would wonder what, 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 what does your definition of Al-Athari mean? Mm. what do you really mean by it? What, what, what does it constitute to? so you think that's why people would separate the different synonyms of e yeah it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tariqa shaytaniya mm. that existed you know it's a, it's a satanic way like mm. Shaytan, when he came to Adam alayhi salam, mm. and he wanted to take him out of Jannah, you know, he has to convince Adam to eat from a tree that Allah told him not to eat from. Mm. And so he has to change the name, and so he called it Shajaratul Khuldi wa Mulki la Yabla. See, Shaykh, you know, of course today, you know, the terminology, the term Salafi, if you go to Uganda where I live, yeah. you know, it means like Tabliki Jama'at. You know, if you go to Germany, it means ISIS. Mm. You know. You know, they have so many, it's Ajit. misunderstood. Sahih. Of course, if someone understands the true meaning, then, of course, it'll be, you know, then they understand. But some people kind of detach for them reasons, but you're saying that some people are trying to detach to slowly I mean, kind of we, we change do, the... There's no must, you have to call yourself a Salafi. Mm. You don't have to call yourself mm. a Salafi. You can avoid calling yourself a Salafi mm. for this reason or another. It doesn't... Mm. It doesn't... It doesn't... Uh, mm matter in that sense. Mm. I mean, there are people who call themselves Salafi every day and they shout mm. it. doesn't make them Salafi necessarily. Yeah. And there are a group of people who don't shout on the microphone calling themselves mm. Salafi. But when you look at their Mu'taqad and you look at their mm. Manhaj and their Tariqah, they're Salafis. Mm. So it's not about uh, when you write your name after it, do you write a Salafi after it? Mm. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily yeah. uh, mean that. Uh, the poet he said, Kullu, he said wa kullu waslan bilayla, wa layla la bidak. Every man he claims the love of a woman by the name of Layla. Everyone loved her. Mm. So kullu yadda'i waslan bilayla. Every man comes and he said, I have a relationship with Layla. You know, Layla knows me, we may have her relation. Mm. But Layla knows none of those guys. So Salafi sometimes in some situations mm. it's like that. A lot of people claim it. Mm. 
and say, I, you know, this is it's me. You're looking at Salafia. Mm. This is it. This is the definition of Salafia. But as the poet said, Sarat Musharriqatin wa Sirtan Mugharribin fa shatana bayna Musharriqin wa Mugharribin. It's like the East and the West. So the name doesn't really. Al Ibrata bil Ma'ani. The, they say, ليس العبرة بالألفاظ والمباني we, we don't look at the construction of words mm. and how you formulate this and that. The haqaiq and the, maba- and the ma'ani is what's looked at. Mm. The reality and the true meaning in, mm. in things. So like we have today, people call uh, riba. Allah says in the Quran, يمحق الله الربا ويربي الصداقات They call it mm. interest. Mm. You yeah. see? In the UK, they call alcohol juice. <laughs> you know, I'm drinking juice. They call drugs food. You see? So it's, it's You're like... showing you street cred now, Sheikh. Yeah. <laughs> with all of that, subhanAllah. <laughs> yeah, with all of that, yeah. subhanAllah, you can say it's that. It's the actual meaning, yeah. Yeah, they yeah. changed the word. Yeah. Uh, so it's calling Ash'ariya Athariya or calling it Salafiya. It doesn't change anything. So it's nothing. Mm. In Somalia, the Sufis, the Quburiya, Mm. The Quburis, grave worshippers in Somalia, they call, they call themselves Ahlul Sunnah. Mm. They call themselves Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Mm. To the extent if you go to Somalia and say, I'm Ahlul Sunnah, they think you're the Quburi. Like yeah. that's, it's become yeah. a synonym yeah. of theirs. So mm. it's, not, it's not the name, it's mm. how you live by it and mm. the way you are in terms of. And another thing I, I, I really need to mention is that Salafiyah, a lot of people, even that the most fundamental part of Salafiyah is the Aqidah, and it is the most fundamental part. Mm of the religion of al-Islam. But as you know, in books of Aqidah, like Sharh al-Sunnah al-Imam al-Muzani, at the ending mm. of it, he talks about issues of ibadat, having mm. acts of worship, being mm. a abid, a worshiper of Allah. Mm. Also having a good akhlaq and manners. Mm. If you go to the Kitab al-Aqidah al-Wasatiyah by Ibn mm. Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, at the ending of the book is what? It's manners mm. and how to call to Allah Azza wa Jalla. Aqidah al-Wasatiyah. And the ending, he talks about ibadat and worshipping of Allah Azza wa Jalla. So it's Salafiyya is, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an entire yeah. way of life. Mm. So you can't be a person who's so concerned about aqidah mm. alone and mm. you abandon the way you carry yourself and yeah. the manners you deal with others. You, know, you have a good uh, series on that with yeah. the, uh, the Manhaj al-Salaf, the uh, Manhaj Sheikh Ubaylan. The Ubaylan's Kitab, yeah. yeah. We did it with Sheikh Ahmed in... You know, Sheikh Ahmed in Kuwait. Kuwait. I've Allah shown him your, uh, Allah your series. That's how we came to know you. Sure. Allahumma barik. Well, yeah, I mean, I recommend that for anyone who's... Uh, Definitely. You know, they can actually follow that. Yeah. It changes a lot, to be honest. If, yeah. we, if, if Salafi was followed in all of those ways, the akhlaq and the way mm. we deal with people, it, it's... it's uh, I feel like it's necessary to mention one point, subhanAllah, um, that is, it's a situation of now that's happening. Mm. Uh, today, I was speaking to... In the morning, I was speaking to some family members. Um, which is motor mufaja'ah, just sudden death. Uh, news reached me this morning mm. that Kobe Bryant died. Yeah, subhanAllah. And I was quickly looking, looking up, you know, he died at age of 41. His 13 year old daughter was with him. And it was on his private jet from a private plane, helicopter, uh, or plane, right? Helicopter. And, yeah, yeah and, he, and he just, you know, he, he crushed and he just died. And subhanAllah, it, it really brings you back to the reality of mm. you know, wherever you are, mm. you never know. Death is going to come to you, you know. Mm. Wherever you, you don't know that time and that moment where it's written for you, that you're going to die and you're going to pass away. He oh. just retired a couple of years back. You know, he came out of the game. His plan was to live the mm. life now he wants to live. What's it. interesting, he just... I think another basketball just beat his record or something that night. You know, like he, his record or something. He had he had a record of the amount yeah, of points. Yeah, they said it was the best NBA. But I think he got beat that night. That record got beat. So it's like his legacy was also taken from him just before as well. Just before he passed away. You know, you know, because the non-Muslims they they all about their legacy. It's so true. He got the likes of Richard Dawkins. He's trying to plan a statue at Oxford University. Of himself. This is how they are. Because they, so, that's all they have. That's true. The the hereafter, you know. But, yeah, so subhanAllah, I, you never I, know. You never know a lie. And I, I really want us to take, mm. at this moment right now, at this particular moment, to take from it, mm. 
you know, if there's any good that you know you could do. The poet, he said, فَإِنْتَكُ بِالْأَمْسِ اقْتَرَفْتَ إِسَاءَةً فَثَنِّ وَأَنْتَ حَمِيدُ فَثَنِّ بِإِحْسَانٍ وَأَنْتَ حَمِيدُ وَلَا تُرْجِ فِعْلَ الْخَيْرَاتِ إِلَى غَدٍ لَعَلَّ غَدًا يَأْتِي وَأَنْتَ فَقِيدُ The poet, he said, if yesterday you did a mistake hmm. and you, you went against Allah Azza wa Jalla yesterday, meaning in the past, فَثَنِّ Today, come with good actions. فَثَنِّ بِإِحْسَانٍ وَأَنْتَ حَمِيدُ Today, right now, this moment, come with good things. Benefit from it now. You live in this moment. ولا ترجف على الخيرات إلى غد. Don't ever say tomorrow, because tomorrow could mm. come and you're not here. Mm. So the scholars they took from this three. Two, three. You are mm. divided into three: the past, the present, and the future. The past is gone. Mm. It's gone. There's nothing um, you can do about it. In the sense where you can't bring back what you've done. The present is what you're living right now. And the future is to come. Mm. The, the, poet, the, the poet, he said, uh, you know, مَا فَاتَ وَرَبَ مَا ذَهَبَ مَا مَضَى فَات وَالْمُؤَمَّلُ غَيْبٌ وَلَكَ السَّاعَةُ الَّتِي أَنْتَ فِيهَا مَا مَضَى فَات Whatever has happened in the past mm. is gone. وَالْمُؤَمَّلُ غَيْبٌ And the future that you're hoping for, it, Allah mm. وَلَكَ السَّاعَةُ الَّتِي أَنْتَ فِيهَا you only have the time that you're living in. This moment mm. is what you have. You can claim this. And the beauty about Islam is that it gives you the opportunity to rectify what happened in the past. Mm. A tawbah. And asking Allah for forgiveness. And rectifying your situation. You see, the angel of death taking the life of people around us is actually a sign that he's coming to you. He takes mm. around all the fortresses around you. Mm. you know, all the people around you. Your cousin, mm. he, yeah, he's gone. Your other friend, oh, he's gone as well. The person you used to look up to, he's gone as well. The person you admire, he's gone. And you're left with literally who? Yourself. Mm. And you're still thinking, okay, so and so is going to die. And it's not, it's you. So it's us that need to pay, take, it's us that needs to be taking uh, lessons from those who are dying around us. Mm. Um, I think an opportunity like this, where everyone sees what happened, and it's like a shock. I was reading comments of what mm. people were saying. It's like a nightmare, some mm. people were saying, because they looked up to him. Mm. And um, at the age of 41, you know, this is... I mean, obviously, we're from England. You know, we don't, not really into <coughs> basketball as much, but mm. this is like the, the Ronaldo of oh, yeah. basketball. It is. You know, it is. It's, it's a big thing. It's a big thing for, you know, for the it's States. Really it's really big. And, it really uh, is a big thing, yeah. But it's just... You know, mm. Time is very mm. Time is the most valuable thing Allah has given mm. us subhanahu wa ta'ala. Honestly, it's the best thing. Mm. You know, my father's with me now in the country. Sure. And uh, subhanAllah, I, I saw my father when we were young, of course, he raised me. And now that my father is old, I have a conversation with him. We're talking every day, we're chatting, I'm asking him questions. I'm asking him why he did that in the past because I want to learn experience first. I want to implement it in my life, the wisdom behind his actions. Um, and why didn't he try this method? And what was the wisdom behind why he didn't? I'm going to take as much from him. And subhanAllah, the way that my father now observes life and the way he looks at it, and when we were young, the way he looked at it, it just shows me, subhanAllah, that's the ma'al for everyone. Mm. That's the road for every individual, path that we're all heading towards. I said to my dad that, you know, he said to me, um, he's not worried about anything except his what? His ibadah, as long as that's intact. Mm. Mm. As long as that, um, it's, it's done. And he, you know, he emphasizes on Abdurrahman, you know, نِعْمَتَانِ مَغْبُونُ فِيهِمَا كَثِيرٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ سِحَّةُ وَالْفَرَاغِ Two blessings that we have, we don't value it, but we will when we lose it. سِحَّةُ وَالْفَرَاغِ Siha means health and al faragh the free time that we have. These two so big wallah. It is truly so So my dad's now going through health issues and stuff. Mm. And so I end up, you know, taking him around to places, hospitals and checkups and stuff like that. And I'm seeing that the ni'mah that we have of having health and the ni'mah that we have in terms of time as well. Mm. And you know it's amazing, Ibn al Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala. Before him, Abu Wafa ibn Aqil mentioned it as well. And I also read it in the Kitab al-Jahid by 
Jahad in his Kitab al Haywan. But he's a Mu'tazili, I would advise mm. no one to read his works. Um, he mentioned that these two, which are um, Al Siha, health, and Al Faraq, free time, are united or they're both present in the Shab, the youth. Mm. That's why the significance came. It's the mm. two most common in the Shabab. Mm. And that's why when you look at the hadith, Hadith Abi Barzat al-Aslami, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, That a person's leg will not move from his position until they are asked about four questions. In the hadith, um, it mentions an umri fi ma'afnah, how he spent his time, wa an shababihi, separated it from it. He's asked about his life, how he spent it, and then after that, how he spent his youth. But youth is part of your life. No, it's got significance. This is not just part of your life. Mm. It was the golden days of your life. SubhanAllah. It got separately mentioned. Mm. And it's from the seven things that Allah wa Ta'ala He says, um, or the hadith in the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, Seven types of people Allah is going to give them a shade the day when there is no shade. And who is that? Someone who's a, a shabun. Youth. The youth, a shabun nasha'a fi ta'atillahi. A youth who grew up in the obedience of Allah Azza wa Jalla. I came across a hadith that really amazed me. Abu Dawood and Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah and Ahmed narrated it. That the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Inna Allah la ya'ajabu. Allah is fascinated. Allah is amazed. Of who? Shabu laysa lahu sabwa. A youth who doesn't have, you know, like, he doesn't have uh, the, the weaknesses that are present in youth. Hmm. He's just steadfast. He's in the masjid. He's up to good. He says, he says khair. He stays away from shurur and evil. Just Allah is fascinated with this. Because hmm. the, everything in us hmm. as youths, uh, it works against you know, the concept of being steadfast and everything. Hmm. So I realized that ahmiyatul waqt and ahmiyatul siha. And the Arabs, they say, they say, الصِّحَّةُ تَاجٌ عَلَى رُؤُوسِ الْأَصِّحَّةِ لَا يَرَاهُ إِلَّا الْمَرْضَى They say that health is a crown on the head of the one who is healthy. And no one else sees it except the sick ones. Mm. People are sick and see that crown on your head. You can't see it because it's a crown. It's on your head. Mm. You can't see it. But everyone else sees it. Um, and things like that, health, and time are genuinely the things that people value when it goes. Once it's gone, mm. you start seeing people thinking over it. Oh, oh I should have done that. Because um, the qaida is al muasaratu hirman. Al muasaratu hirman means what you have generally prevents you from seeing its value mm. and appreciating it. Mm. The poetry, the Arabs, they say also, and it's from the Arab proverb, is they say that Laylat al Dalma yuftaqatul Badr. The night, when it's pitch dark, the people, they value the full moon. Mm. Like, well, is the moon, you know? All that mm. time it was there, no one knew the mm. value of the moon, and it, it didn't have anything to them. But when it's gone, it's like, mm. oh, you know? And so this issue of uh, um, the basketball player passing away and dying, it's like a river and a lesson for, uh, you know, Kobe Bryant at the age of 41, dying mm. with his 30-year-old daughter, passing away, and it's just mm. random death. We won't say random, because it's all written. Yeah. It's all written. Maktub and Allah. You Allah. just imagine the, what the family are going through. You know, they've got like, I think, a half a billion mm -hmm. they have. It's true. It doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't it. benefit. Yeah, it, does not, yeah. it, doesn't ta it doesn't taste good it's, uh, with all of that. Like in, it's, again, it's a lesson for, yeah. you know, they said that al al aqil man bighayrihi. Mm. The smart person, the clever person is the one who takes lessons from other people. Mm. You know. Mm. I read Al Imam Ibn Rajab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Ibn Rajab al Hanbali mentioned a story. Of course, it's from the Sira Iliyat, and the story, of course, is not uh, going to have in it a chain which is authentic, but the concept is true. Mm. That a man once said to the angel of death, You know, I don't want you to just take my life like that. You know, they said the angel mm. of death. Back in those days, he used to come to the people in a, mm. in a form and they would, he would take it and they would see it walking around. That's mm. what he said. So, 
a man said to the angel of death, you know, for me, you can't just do it like that. Give me some signs. Tell me you're coming. So I'm, I'm ready. The angel of death said, you know what? I'll do that for you. I promise you. I'll make sure that when I come to you, you know I'm coming. It won't just be a... I won't just fall into, the, uh, into your house. I'll come and I'll let you know. And so what he did was, uh, years went by and then the angel of death came to him. The man said, look, you, we had a promise. You and I agreed on something that you won't just come like that. You made sure that when you come, you give me a sign that you're about to come. And he said, I did. I told you. He said, no, you didn't. If you did, I would have prepared. I would have known. And so he said to him, where is so-and-so? He said, he's dead. Your best friend, he's dead. What about so-and-so, who's your neighbor? He's dead. What about your oldest son? He's gone. What about this person? He's gone. What about this person? He's gone. I took all those people around you. And if a person's fortress goes down, then the attack can come to them directly. I did that. Mm. I took all the people around you, and you never took a lesson from that. Mm. You, never, you never pondered over that and contemplated and took that as a lesson. So what he said was, um, I gave you all the signs that you needed, but you just didn't see it. You just didn't see the sign. So what I say is that this, this world, everything around us is a lesson for us. Mm. It's us to take lessons mm. from it and learn, and learn from it and acquire. And I've realized the more you look into things and you always take that situation and you apply it on yourself and you say, look, how can this rectify my life and how can, I, mm. how can, it, better, how can it better me in, in my future? I, I promise you'll appreciate it. You know, when you're young, when you're very young, mm. Um, your early stages in, in da'wah and, mm. and, and seeking knowledge, you don't look at the nusus for yourself, you look mm. at it for other people. Mm. You don't do that. When you look at the ayah, you're like, yeah, look at them. They went, oh, Allah, these kuffar, these innovators, oh, Allah, they went, look at them. So you forget to look at it for yourself first. What nasib or portion do you have mm. from this verse yourself? Mm. You see, I was amazed the other day I read that Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he said about himself, he said, 20 years, 20 years, he said, I was forcing myself, you know, nurturing myself on praying Qiyamul Layl. You know, because it was a burden for me. For 20 years, it was a burden. I was praying, I was forcing myself. So the next 20 years, it became a joy and leather for me. It became an enjoyment for me. I enjoyed it for the next 20 years of my life, I enjoyed it. So the reason why these people were like that and they were unique and they, they had all of that, rahimahumullah, is they, they believed this theme, they believed in Allah wa ta'ala qalban wa qaliban. You know, they believed Allah externally in their hearts and also outside. It was, it was, real, it was real, everything was intact. Um, Jazakallah khair, Shaykh. Shaykh, I don't want to take too much of your time. I could sit here all day just benefiting. Jazakallah khair. And uh, thank you for uh, giving, you, giving, giving us your time and uh, sharing the thoughts with us. And inshallah, we'll stay in touch and hopefully we can do. So, is there anything you want to say? Final words? Yeah, I do want to say. I'm not yeah, a no, sheikh. No. I'm not a sheikh. If I become one, I'll message you. I'll let you know, inshallah. When I make it there and I, and I become the sheikh of, the inshallah. Sheikh of whatever city I'm in, inshallah, I'll let you know. But for now, I'm uh, hmm. your brother, Abdul Rahman, to be honest. Uh, yeah. And I don't mind if people call me Abdul Rahman. It's no Sheikh, problem. I'm calling me. you Sheikh because you're old now. Yeah, I am. Jazakallah khair, Sheikh. Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. Salam alaikum. May Allah bless you. Jazakallah khair. Innaka la tahdi man ahbabata walakin Allah yahdi man yashat.